So uh, this slide says, uh, how do we write the, the write this function for the graph? But they've already done that for you. So I'm not too worried about writing this one. But I, I do want to look up here at these questions where it says the, the domain. Um, and then the, the the domain of the entire function, the domain of a piece, and then the function, even though that's kind of weird, but um, of, of of that same piece. So let's start with the overall domain. What's the uh, what's the domain of this step function? Now, if if you're not sure, this it's also written here, but I think it's easier to look at just the graph. What is the domain of that step function? How far left do we go? Negative five, and it's inclusive because we do touch negative five. Are there any discontinuities as you go to the left uh, up until you reach that last piece? There are not because even though you have an open point here, right above it, it's a closed point. Even though you have an open point here, right above it is a closed point. Even though we have an open point here, there's a closed point. So there are no discontinuities on the domain. Yeah. If there's a gap, like you'll you'll see when. Now I know that again. I know that you already did this because I asked you to finish the rest of those next like five slides yesterday. So, but there's one coming up where you can see some. You can see a little bit of uh, something a little bit different. So how far do we go on the domain? And it does look like it goes up to five. Also inclusive. What is the domain of the bottom left piece, or the bottom left step, as they call it? Bracket negative 5, because that's where we first started. And it goes up to negative 3 with a parenthesis. That's this piece here. Solid. It goes up to negative 3. Then open. Now, when they mean by... so. Just so you understand, because like this didn't come out of somebody wrote this, and I, I don't think this is the verbiage they use in books. But so when they met by domain, they they were basically telling you to look down here, and like this part is the domain. That's the same thing we just wrote, but we wrote it in, in interval notation. Now when they say function, they're talking about this part. So on that first piece, what's the function rule? Yeah, negative 4, but you should also be writing it together with that. So the function would be f of x is equal to negative 4. <clears throat> Lydia, where's your packet? Zeke, who are you hiding from? I promise I haven't told Kelvin anything. He doesn't know. All right. Graph the piecewise. How many pieces are there in this piecewise function? Four? Oh, dear. Two. There are two pieces. There are going to be two pieces. And what word can you coincidentally use to describe both pieces? Linear. These are both lines. Um... What are the minimum amount of points you need in order to graph a line? Two. If you can, so as long as you can get two accurate points, that's all we need, and we just connect the dots, right? So that's what I'm going to do with each piece. Now, ideally, I would want either one or both of the points to be endpoints, but these pieces each only have one endpoint, and they're both at negative three. So for this first piece, where the output uh, is negative 2x minus 3, I'm going to use negative 3 as an endpoint, but since I don't have any other endpoint, I can just pick any other point that's part of that domain. Ready, go. Give me another point. Okay. Yeah, I like, and I'll go ahead and use that. Last period, I used negative 6. Um, I try not to keep them too close because if they're too bunched together, then, then you might mess up the line. But um, negative 5 should work out okay. Uh, negative 2 times negative 3. <clears throat> is uh, 6 minus 3 is 3. Negative 2 times negative 5 is 10 minus 3 is 7. So I'll go ahead and graph that eventually. Then the second piece is just x plus 1. 
Again, I want to use the end point, which is, it happens to be their negative 3 also. <clears throat> but since I don't have any other um, end points, I can just pick any other point that's in that domain. What input would you like to use that falls in that domain? Oh, I love you. Not, nobody said that last period. I love zero. Anytime I get a chance to plug in zero, I love zero. Zero is my favorite. <clears throat> negative three plus one is negative two. Yeah, that gives me one. So first I'm going to plot negative three, three. Uh, oops, what did I do wrong? Open, yeah, negative three, three is open. <clears throat> negative five, seven. And then that. And then the next piece is negative three, negative two. That one's closed. Zero, one, that one's closed. And even though they don't ask us here, since Hannah loves math so much, we'll do this for Hannah. Um, let's just do this verbally. The domain and range. What would you say the domain is of this piecewise function? All real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. There are no discontinuities, Yash. The left piece goes on forever left. The right piece goes on forever right. There is no input where I would not be able to return an output. <clears throat> How, here, let me write it down, because if I don't write it, you don't write it. And how about the range? What do you think, Tom? Oh, very good. We go as low as negative 2, and really, we don't even need that left piece, because... Um, that right piece is going to span the entire range. Any questions there? <clears throat> Write a function to model this graph. Uh, without giving you too much info, I, I wouldn't freak out too much about these. I haven't seen too many of these on uh, on the quiz and test. I, like I'm, I'm going off the top of my head, but I, I don't really remember too many of them. Uh, but these are regressions. The ones where you're going backwards, they're giving you the graph and you come up with the function. But it's still something that's good to know. Since I don't see any points written on the ends here, I'll assume that it, these are just arrows that got cut off. They don't give this function a name, but let's just call it f of x. How many pieces are there? Yes, Ju um, Julian. Well, we'll get there. Let's let's just go one one step at a time. <clears throat> I think uh, overall, you you would probably find it easier to do the domain side first. We'll worry about what Julian, like coming up with the function afterwards, but let's do the domain. How many pieces are there? What is the domain of that first uh, piece to the left? And, and we're not going to write it in interval notation. We're going to write it in, in set notation, <clears throat> like using inequality. Again, uh, like I know I've programmed you to use interval notation over and over and over again. But now, in this case, we're just looking at, hey, here's an endpoint. It's all going this way. How would you describe that using an inequality? There you go. X is less than 4. Those are all the Xs that are less than 4. Notice how it doesn't have a less than or equal to because of the open point, the open endpoint. Landon, how about the second piece? It should be a little bit easier because it's going from left to right. why he gets all the ladies. Good job. So now, yeah, we got to come up with a with a function rule, right? And can okay, we agree what, what types of functions are these going to be? They're both linear. 
And the most common way of writing a linear function is slope-intercept form, which is y equals mx plus b, which would mean I need the slope and I need the y-intercept. Yeah, I, part of the reason why I think we struggle with these is not so much because we, we don't understand the piecewise part of it. I think it's just because we never really learned how to uh, graph and write linear functions. So to answer your question, Julian, yes, I'm at the point right now where if, like, say, I, I look, I need a slope and I need a y-intercept, if you want to find the slope by counting, whatever. I, I'm not going to do it. I still believe in finding things algebraically. I want to be able to teach you, like, you know, to be able to handle any situation. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's not that easy to count, but, you know, whatever. Um, now, before we find the slope of that first left piece, can we agree the type of slope that, that it should end up having? Because the most common mistakes with slope are with signs. And you should have learned in Algebra 1 that there's, that there's four types of uh, slopes. It's positive, negative, zero, and undefined. So what type of slope is that? What type of slope goes up and to the left and down and to the right? Oh, dear. Positive, yeah. So I, I should end up with a positive. I'm, if I'm ending up with a negative, I'm doing something wrong. Okay? Uh, you can do what Julian said to do, which is to say, hey, account, look, my rise and my run is up one, right one, up one, right one, up one, right one. So it sure does look like my slope is, uh, I know it has to be positive. It's going to be positive 1 over 1, which is just 1. So I will put 1x, which is just x. And normally I have to find the um, the y-intercept. But here I can see the y-intercept, so there's no need to find the y-intercept. Where is that crossing the y-axis? At 4. Like, logically, it would make no sense to find it, so x plus 4. Now, with that being said, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll leave the y-intercept as is. I'm not going to mess around with that because it's, it's obvious. You can see it. But let's see how we could still find that information algebraically um, as far as the, the slope goes. Pick two points that are on that left piece. You just need two points. Negative 4, what? Okay, I like those. Yeah, anything on an axis I like, so that's good. Negative 4, 0. It doesn't matter. It can be any two points. And then what else? And 0, 4 I like also. Perfect. They're on an axis, so slope formula says subtract the y's. Subtract the x's, I get negative 4 over negative 4, which does indeed give me 1. I just confirmed what we counted on the graph before. Now, the second piece does have a bit more of a requirement for algebra because we don't see where it's crossing the y-axis. Now, can we agree what type of slope that should have? based on the direction it's headed. Negative, when you go up and to the left or down and to the right, that's a negative slope. Negative slopes go in that direction. They are decreasing. Um, now, to find the slope, if you want to just count and you can tell, hey, this is going to uh, going down with two and then right one, fine, but I'd be careful because sometimes it's not as easy as you might think. Okay, the, the better approach for me, I'm not, I'm not scared of algebra, is to find two points. Can you... Yeah, look, uh, the one they're giving me, I might as well use that one. Um, so 4, 2. So 4, 2. And then uh, 5, 0. I think that one was, Emily, you wanted one? Or were you going to say Emily? I like it when Emily contributes. Um, so slope is 2 minus 0 over 4 minus 5. 2 over negative 1, which is negative 2. So I know this is going to start off with a negative 2x. But I need to know the y-intercept. It seems like the consensus here the last time we tried this was that you guys prefer just to use that. You didn't like point slope. Point slope was way too much algebra for you. This distributive property and adding was too much, so let's just plug in here. So, okay, if you want to know b... Because B is what I'm looking for. I have to plug something in for these other three. Obviously, what's the M going to be? I just found it. So what's the M going to be? Negative 2. When, what do you think I'm going to put in for the X and the Y? One of the two points. Pick one of the two points. You want 5, 0? Right, I, love, I love my zeros. So uh, now make sure you put the 0 where the Y goes. M is negative 2. X will be 5 plus B. 
So 0 equals negative 10 plus b plus 10 plus 10, you end up with 10 is b. And that makes sense because now if you look at the picture, it looks like if this were to continue, it would probably cross around 10. So that's called using context. Some of you just blindly put stuff in a calculator and you're like, oh, yeah, I got negative 10. Well, yeah, that makes no sense. There's no way that this line is going to cross at negative 10. So try to pay attention to that. Questions there? Lydia? Me? Ali? can't I, I'm not saying there's a y intercept but what it's saying is that if the domain of that piece included the y axis if it were to go that far that's where it would cross but the y axis is not part of that function's domain but all of the points that are on here abide by this rule here um, can you agree that a negative 6 falls on that piece? Okay, so let's put in an 8 for uh, x and let's see what happens. What's negative 2 times 8? Plus 10? Negative 6. So no, it's not going to touch the y-axis. That's why I said if it were to continue, but it doesn't continue. There's an endpoint there. But if it were to continue, that's where it would touch the y-axis. That's that's the form of a line. A form of a line is slope intercept form. Like you need a y intercept. It just it doesn't the domain there does not include the y axis. It just doesn't go that far. <clears throat> Yas is the one I was telling you about, but you, that you already knew about because you did it already. Here they're only asking us about domain and range, right? So if somebody were to ask about like, hey, discontinuities, what? Let's start with domain. How far left does this go? Negative infinity, agreed. We have this little left arrow there going all the way to infinity. But as we go to the right, uh-oh, there's a discontinuity. What, what input there would not give me an output? Negative 3. If I look here at negative 3, the only points I have are open. That's a gap. It's an infinitely small gap, but it's a gap. So I have to cut off my domain at negative 3. Put a parenthesis because there is no output there. Then do a union. Start on the other side of that infinitely small hole. And then how far can we go now from negative 3? All the way to 3 because, uh-oh, the same thing happens again. When I reach positive 3, the only points I have there are empty. So my domain has to stop there. I cannot. Get, if you were to ask me what the output was at 3, I would not be able to give you one. And then union, we would start up at that 3 again because the green piece starts at 3. And then how far do we go? Positive infinity. The range is a little bit trickier. How low do we go? Yeah, we go as low as negative 1, but notice that that's a horizontal line. It, it, it doesn't move anywhere vertically. It doesn't go up or down. There's no span. Okay? Now, you might see this open dot and focus on it and say, well, hey, well, it's going to be a parenthesis. Well, no, because even though I, I don't touch it there at 3, all of these are all closed points. A, a line, a ray, there's a geometry. Like, what, what what's a... What is a uh, segment, a ray, a line? What are all those made up of? Points, and really an infinite amount of points. So there's still an infinite amount of places where I could get negative 1 as an output, so that negative 1 is going to have to be in a bracket. Union. Okay, now as I go up, there is a gap. There's nothing in between here. If I go all the way across, there's nothing in between there. So where does my range start again? No. 
at zero. Okay, and this does touch, even though you don't see a point like emphasized there, it does touch, so we would start at bracket zero. How high do we go? Yeah, we go as high as three, but that would take a parenthesis because it's open. There are no closed points at three. And then Yash, what would be the last piece of my range? Yeah, if you go further up, there's a horizontal line at four. Oops. Questions? Oh man, did I skip something? Oh man, I didn't see this last period. Okay. Well, you guys get free math. Uh, let's do some evaluating. What is F at negative four? What's the output we get at negative four? If these are all X's, what I'm about to give you are Y's. What Y goes with negative four? Uh, two. How about negative one? Negative one, negative one. Yeah, that's down there. Good. How about at four? Four does look like it. Wow, that's, this thing is off. Okay. How about at one? Good also gives me negative one. How about at two? What does that mean? Undefined, it is not defined. At two, it's not the same thing as zero. At two, there is no output. There's no Y there. These are both empty points. There's nothing there. And negative, I can't even see negative eight. That has to be undefined also, right? No. Why? Because it is horizontal and it goes on forever. So by the time it crosses negative 8, we'll still be at 2. Let's do this one. Here, why don't you try it? You see how it says you try? So why don't you try it? I'll give you like 30 seconds. Go, Sophie, go. Go, Sophie, go. Take a look at my board. Take a look at your paper, Emily. Your eyes are really close to the paper, so you should be able to see it. Did you get something different? If you did, say something. Tom, same things. What is the domain and range for the graph at the left? Oh, this is kind of a weird, let's assume that this is shaded in here. I don't know how it looks on your paper, but it came out like gray on my screen. So let's just assume that's a close point. Yash, my domain expert. What is the domain? Hmm? I don't know, you tell me. What is the domain? Yeah, I just filled it in because they, they filled it in in gray, which is kind of weird, but I just filled it just some 
just so that there's no confusion about that. Because it, it was like gray before, but. It's, it's... Go ahead, Caleb. Take that. Dominates on the field and off the field. All real numbers. Caroline, you feel left out? You want to do range? Range is going to be tricky. It, it, this fooled one of my smartest kids last year. Miles, you want to give it a shot? No, no, there's a range. You're fading off. Very good. Because you guys focus on, like, the thing is, since the, this piece up here looks short, you kind of ignore it, but it's got an arrow. That's going down all the way to negative infinity. And then how high do we go? We go up to three, but it's not included. Uh, evaluate as indicated. Uh, negative three. Is that two? Zero. Is that negative two? Which is here. Uh, I'll, I'll shade in the points for you if you want. Negative 3, 2 is right there. <coughs> uh, 5 is still going to be at negative 2 because that's the horizontal line. That's what it is uh, here. And then negative 5. Uh, very good. Was that landed? Yes. Nice. Good. Juancito, domain of that one. Uh, good. Yes, Caroline. Let's go. Yeah. Negative infinity and then three with a bracket. Uh, for this one here, like, let's just ignore this. Because those are weird. Like, it. It crossed like in between a grid. There's no way to know. But we can do the other ones. What's our negative one? Three. Yeah, three. And what's two? Also three. Oh, I keep on missing. I didn't see this last period either. Ooh. Okay, yeah, let's do this one. I didn't do. I didn't see this one last period. Let's assume that these are filled in. Yash, you want to give it another crack at it? No! Yash. How far left does it go, Yash? Yeah, okay, so you got that part right. But as you start going to the right, there's a gap here, man. Look, there's, there's nothing there. So where do we have to stop? No, nah, I know that's a big-looking point, but it looks... It might look that way, but... I'm I'm reading that as more of a zero. It's they did a little bit sloppy job on the point, but I'm reading that as a zero, and since it uh, is filled in bracket union, where do we start again? Uh, no. Negative three. Yeah, we're starting. At, we're, this is left to right. We're starting at three inclusive up until positive infinity. How about El Rangel? Uh oh. You want to think about it, Caroline? Go ahead, Jonathan. No? Alexi's got it. Go, Alexi, go. Good. Negative infinity is a good start. Negative one with a bracket because it's filled in. Union. Yeah, then that would go zero. The positive. Sweet. What is H at three? Zero. 
that's this endpoint here that was filled in. What's h at zero? Negative one. That's this endpoint here. What is uh, h at negative five? One, two, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. What's that? Another thing, negative five also. And then at two, ooh, undefined. That symbol is known as the empty set. It means undefined. All right, so that is everything that I have to teach you on piecewise. I will not do anything else on piecewise until after the quiz. The quiz will have piecewise. We'll go over the quiz on uh, on Wednesday. But from now to the quiz, that's it. That's all. If you want to you can come for individual help, you can go back and watch the videos, but I'm done with piecewise. I told you that this was a bit of a hodgepodge unit. So that was the hodge. Here comes the podge. These don't really necessarily have anything to do with each other, but this is the second part of the unit, which is geometric series. <clears throat> now, about, back in Algebra 1, you were introduced to something called a geometric sequence. And since we're all learners, we don't just memorize things for short amounts of times, but we learn them and retain them. Can anybody tell me here what a geometric sequence is? First period did a surprisingly good job of this. At least a couple of people knew. I was impressed that they actually remembered some stuff about it. So, Julian, you want to give it a shot? No? Yeah. Are you cheating? Landon. Sneaky Landon. Nobody? Ouch. <clears throat> well, what does what, what sequence imply? If we're talking about a sequence. A what? I just don't know how to describe it. Curse you, English, English language. A sequence is a group of numbers. Okay? Uh, when the word, when the adjective geometric is used, that means that that group of numbers has a common ratio, okay? You were introduced to that in in Algebra 1. When, what do I mean by common ratio? Common ratio means that to get from one number to the next, you have to multiply. So, like, let's say I were to do uh, <coughs> 'll is a group of numbers, okay what's the first number that I wrote down in that group of numbers? Five okay, that's going to be important today, and what is my common ratio to get from one number to the next? It's two to get from one number to the next, I am multiplying times two, okay five times two is ten, ten times two is twenty times two is forty times two is uh eighty, and so on and so forth. That is my common ratio. <clears throat> when a common ratio is greater than one, that se um, sequence is set to diverge. When it is less than one, when it's a proper fraction, um, it's set to converge. Now, that's not going to really be important. That, though, that terminology doesn't really get used in the unit, but it's just free information. Now, something interesting happens, though. Let's pretend this common ratio was negative, because that, 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 that could happen. And let's say instead of multiplying by two, Let's say I got crazy. Well, I already am crazy, but let's say I got crazier. Let's say I wanted instead to multiply by negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. What would happen there? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. They, they would alternate signs, 5 times negative 10. Then it would be positive 20, negative 40, negative 160. So keep that in mind. That's something also important to know. You can't have negative common ratios. Juan, how does that paper smell? I sprayed it with lit linen scent. It should smell like fresh linen. Hey, buddy. 
Have you guys noticed, because now they're making us do this on the tests and quizzes lately, there's like these little, it says AKS, 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 because that's, that's supposed to help you learn better. Um, do you guys know what AKS stands for? Yeah, uh, it stands for academic knowledge and standards. It's, it's basically like the standards that we're supposed to teach. So <clears throat> the thing is, all right, watch. Uh, so what you learned before was a, a geometric sequence. So now we're changing the word to series. What series really means is sum. Now it's just not it's not just knowing what the numbers are, but adding them together, getting some subgroup of those numbers and adding them. Now. For whatever reason, the AKS that we're supposed to teach you only says that we need to teach you finite. What does finite mean? There's a beginning and an end. Because some geometric series, believe it or not, can actually be added even if it was infinite. You're like, what? I can add an infinite amount of numbers? Sometimes. But that's not part of the AKS for whatever. I don't know why it's not. So we're going to stick to finite. This formula you are going to use on every single problem that, at least that I can think of, on geometric series. Learn this formula. This formula appears twice in your notes. This one I wrote, the other one is going to be the one that you're going to see. The only difference between the one I wrote and the one that you're going to see on all your tests is where to put this A sub 1. They have it on the side of the fraction. I have it in the numerator. It means the same thing. What do you think the S sub N stands for? Sequence? No. No. What do you think the S stands for? If I just told you what series stands for. Sum, yeah. So the sum of some finite amount of numbers is equal to, what do you think A sub 1 stands for? Because you have it in front of you. Yeah, it's the first amount. So like on that, on that uh, sequence that I just wrote, what was the first amount? Uh, five. Okay. Now these ones are always there. Now, luckily, you're going to have the formula written for you on the quiz and the test, but if you wanted to memorize it, those ones are always there, and you will always subtract them with a common ratio. What was the common ratio on the one I just wrote? Yeah, by the end, it was negative 2, but I first started it with a positive 2, so yeah, that's the common ratio. And then the big difference, and you've got to be careful here, because even though you're subtracting the common ratio on both top and bottom, the ratio on top has an exponent, and that exponent stands for the number of terms you're going to add. So these are this is a finite series. So like if if I wanted you to uh add just the numbers I wrote on the board, how many numbers did I write there? Eight. So you would put an eight there. Okay, it's it's how many numbers you're adding. So you're gonna use this formula pretty much every single time and almost every single time you are gonna use it to find the sum. That's the easiest one. It's already been isolated. There's no need to solve. All you're doing is evaluating the right side. That's the most common, but you could be asked to use it to find an initial amount. You could be used uh, asked to use it to find what the common ratio is. You could be asked to use that formula to solve for a number of terms. How many unknowns are there in that formula? How many black circles do you see on the screen? Four. There are four unknowns. Sum, initial amount, common ratio, number of terms. Anytime you're going to solve for one of them, they have to give you the other three, or at least enough information to find the other three. Yes? Nah. Nah, they're going to ask you. They're going to give you enough information. Right, uh, Zeke? Now, I can pretty much guarantee you that no other teacher is doing this. I haven't seen anybody else do it, but I'm going to – I don't want to say this is cheating, but let's just say it's a shortcut. Depending on what information you're given, the way that you find N, like there are other ways to find N that don't involve having to use this formula. So here's one of them. Okay, and the, you, so you can use this. It gives you a little bit of flexibility depending on what you're given. The, uh, don't get confused by it. What do these mean? Those mean absolute value, right? 
And what does absolute value mean? Positive. Just make sure you're not getting any negatives. So we already know what logs are. So if sometimes if you uh <clears throat> if you need to know how many terms you have and you know the last amount and the first amount, but you don't know how many numbers there are in between, you don't know how many total numbers there are, you can do last divided by first and take the log of the base of the common ratio with that number there. Here, watch. Let, let, let's give it. Here we can see all the numbers, right? We agreed how many numbers are there. How many numbers are in red that I wrote? There's eight, right? But, but let's say we couldn't count. Let's say I had no idea how many numbers are there. Let's try this formula out. What's the last number you see? 640. What's the first number you see? What, what's uh, 640 divided by 5? What's 640 divided by 5? What is it? 128? Okay. What was the common ratio? 2. Now, remember, even, even if I would have put negative 2, um, make it positive, absolute value. Don't put any negatives in here. So go evaluate log base 2 of 128 and take a while. Guess what that's going to give you? 8, because there was 8 numbers there. What's the most common way that we uh, evaluate logs? What do we use most frequently to evaluate logs? Change of base. Change of base. Log 128 divided by log 2. Okay. How to solve for R? Well, I mean, we're going to get into examples. And, I mean, you could try to use this to solve for R. Um, but that, that, that's going to be very rare. Like they could ask you for that. The you might need to know. You won't need to know how to find number of terms. And I'm giving you a few other ways. They might ask you for an initial amount. R isn't that common, but if if we cross that bridge, we'll get there. I, I don't want to waste too much time on that right now. Okay. Here's what I do. Uh, want to. We just talked about this. Okay. Uh, what geometric sequences are and the fact that they have a common ratio. You're going to be asked questions, A, is, is a sequence geometric? A lot of times you can tell. Like, can you, can you tell? What, don't look at anything else here. Just look at this. Can you tell if this sequence is geometric? Yes. Why? How are you going from one number to the next? Times three. To get from here to here, times three, times three, times three. But if you're ever not sure what this slide is telling you, jump to the number in front and divide the number before. What is 6 divided by 2? What is 18 divided? You know, if you divide, divide, divide. And when you divide, in each case, they each give you 3. Is that a common number? Are those all the same? Therefore, that's my common ratio. Okay, is this geometric? Okay, well, if you're not sure, divide. What's 4 divided by 2? What's uh, 9 divided by 4? 2.25. 16 divided by 9, you have to round. Is that a common number? So, now that's not to say that there isn't some, there, there could be some type of pattern there. There could be some type of relationship. It's just not geometric. The relationship is just not geometric. Here's the formula that I just showed you on the first page. As this is the one you'll see more often. The only difference is that they put the a sub 1 in front. It's the same thing. It just means you're multiplying. Now, this here is important. Summation notation. Anybody familiar with the Greek alphabet? What are, what, what are some Greek letters? Omega, alpha, beta, sigma, pi, right? Pi from geometry. Pi is a letter in the Greek alphabet. Delta, yeah, delta looks like a triangle. Yeah. So in math, uh, well, in the Greek alphabet, this is the Greek letter sigma. It looks a little bit like an E. Sigma in math stands for sum. So this is just a way of arranging, like for a geometric series to say, hey, you, Caroline, add these numbers. This is a way that they might ask you for that. Okay, so now this is the arrangement. This is the way it's, it's formed. Um, on the right of this sigma that looks like an E, they're going to write the explicit formula, the explicit definition. 
What do I mean by that? Well, and it's funny. Last year, somebody even actually used the word. They showed me that they remember something from Algebra 1. Uh, exponential. Um, geometric sequences can be described exponentially. And the way you would do that, oh, uh, here, let's go back to that first page to give you something concrete to look at. <clears throat> the way you would do that, what was my common ratio here? Two, right? Originally, it was a two. That becomes the base. The exponent would be n minus one. And then um, <clears throat> you can't put the first amount there. No, you can't. That would be the second amount. Um, uh huh? No, I'm just because I'm gonna write it, but I'm I don't know. I don't know how I'm gonna explain it to you. Um, There'd be a one half in front. Just what? I mean, don't worry too much about the explanation, but do this. Um, what's the fifth number that I wrote? Uh, 80, right? So watch. What's 5 minus 1? 4. What's 2 to the fourth? Actually, wait. That doesn't make sense. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That doesn't make sense. Would it be... Two to the fourth is sixteen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but then that, but it, that doesn't make sense. That'd be the. Oh yeah, maybe it does work. Okay. All right. Five minus one is four. Two to the fourth is sixteen. What's five times sixteen? It's eighty. Yeah, it's eighty. Um, and that should work with any number that's there. So, you won't have to come up with it. That was actually part of algebra one. But what they're going to give you here is the rule that all the numbers have to abide by. Uh, th that's going to be on the right. Expect it to be, what was the word I used? Exponential. This number on the bottom, which is really referred to as the lower limit, I don't know why they didn't use that here. That's where they want you to start adding. So like to go back to the first one, if, if they put a, a 1 there, that means they want you to start adding with the first number, the 5. If I were to put a 4 down there, where do you want me to start adding? At the fourth number, the 40. The, the lower limit is where to – series means sum. This is where do you want me to start adding. Okay, it's called the lower limit. It has an equal sign. It's, that's just the format. It's the way it's just the way it's written. Okay, up here it's called the upper limit. That's where they want you to stop adding. At what number do we want to stop adding? Now, in order to be able to find the sum, we need to know n, right? Here's another formula for n, where this is not written. This is only to be used with summation notation. You're supposed to do upper minus lower plus 1. Now, what ends up happening is that the lower many times is 1, so what happens when you do minus 1 and plus 1 at the end? It cancels, so the people that are half asleep right now end up always thinking that this ends up being n. A lot of times it will be, but not always, and that's where you're going to get tricked. Here, let's see if we can do one real quick before we leave. Here's summation notation. What do I need in order to find the sum? Go back to the sum formula. What do I need? I'm looking for the sum of some amount of numbers here. What do I need? I need n. I need to know how many numbers I have. What else do I need? Common ratio. What else do I need? The first amount, a sub 1. Can I tell any by looking at this right now? Can I tell any of these values? What? I know r. I do not know a1 yet, but I know r. <clears throat> r is the base. It's 0 0.3. The n, I don't know it yet, but I can find it really quickly. The n is just going to be the uh, upper, which is 12, minus the lower, plus 1. So that ends up being 12. What am I still missing? A sub 1. Now you're going to look at, oh, wait, but the last time it was 4. Yeah, but not, not always, and uh, it's because they don't have the n minus 1 there. Um, so the only way that will always work to find A sub 1 is you get the lower limit and you plug it in for n. 
So a sub 1 would be 4 times 0.3 to the first. Put that in the calculator. That should give you 1.2. Well, now that I know that I'm adding 12 numbers, I can make that the subscript here of my sum. So the sum of these 12 numbers is... The first amount, which is 1.2, parentheses, 1 minus, what's the common ratio? 0 0.3, always to the power of n, which is 12, over 1 minus the common ratio. If you know how to put that in your calculator all at once, go for it. If not, try to simplify what you can. You cannot subtract these here on the top because the exponent comes first. So... Um, I, I would just leave this because that's a real ugly decimal and try to put that in your calculator. I did it last period. Does anybody have the calculator on them now? I think it came out to be like 1.71 or 1.7. Here, let me see if I can do this real quick. Uh, 1 minus 0.3 power 12 divided by 0 0.7 times 1.2. 1.71. Yeah, 1.71. We'll stop there. We'll pick it up tomorrow. We're in here tomorrow.